hello. Welcome to Staring into the Abyss. I'm your host, Richard Gerlach. With me, as always, is Matt Brandenburg. Man, I really want to check out these crazy frog lizard people. Do you really? <laughs> I mean, they sound Especially really sweet. That, that, that lake. I mean, I, I, hear, I hear they got a cool city under, under the lake. Yes. And maybe returning from that city is a Vitlame Mist. Uh, trust me, guys, it's too swampy there. <laughs> <laughs> And today's story is Pretty Good Neighbor by Jeffrey Ford, which you can read on Tor.com. Yeah. And this is a really fun story. It, it, was. it did not go the way it, I thought it was going to go. Tr- you ran, no, it yeah, go that, I thought it was going to go either. Yeah, that's, that, that's how I would describe it. It's like, hmm, and then, huh? Yeah. And, yeah. Huh? Okay. Yep. Yep. But I like how like it, it, he he throws in a lot of I one thing I like about it, we'll get to this deeper when we talk about it. I really like how he frames the story. Yeah. How it's kind of like a story within a story in a short story context. Yeah. Where it's like two guys talking and that talking's telling the story and then it affects from the end of the story as well. I think that's an interesting format for a short story. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Um, I'm, not, yeah, no. I'm not that familiar. Like, I haven't read that many stories, so th- it felt a little bit jarring to me. But we'll, we'll get into it when we, when we start th- discussing it. Yeah. I mean, there's no way to make it not feel jarring. Like, one of my favorite novels is The Fisherman by John Lagan. Yeah. And have you have you read The Fisherman, Matt? Oh, yeah, totally. I, I mean, it's I thought a lot about that. It's an incredible book. But, like, the first 50 pages is the beginning of the story. Then the next 125 pages is just our main character telling a story. Then it cuts back to the present where the story that had been told begins manifesting in present time. All right. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's kind of jarring Langan when it trope. happens. It's what? It's the Langan style. A lot of his. <laughs> that, that is a very big Langan trope. Yeah. Oh man, but no, like but it, you, you, there's no way you can really make that kind of format not jarring. But I always find it interesting because I like storytelling a lot and the idea of storytelling. So like stories that deal with storytelling kind of appeal to me in in, in some ways. Yeah, it it I, well, I'll I'll say my thoughts on that because it's interesting, kind of thinking about it and like what happens in this story. So. I'll just say oh, it, yeah. but it, it's a neat style, a neat way to relay a story to us. So, Oh, very much so. Also, I need to go in and buy this book, but Chuck Tingle's debut horror novel just came out. Oh, it's called Camp Damascus. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. yeah. And love is real. <laughs> I need to check one out. I, I love Chuck Tingle, but um. <laughs> I just think of Tor, and Tor reminded me, oh, Tor released the Chuck Tingle novel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, like, for real, like, it's, I always think, I think Tor, even if you don't like the story, what Tor puts out, I think Tor's always putting interesting fiction on their website. So yeah. it's, it's worth, it's worth a check. If it clicks with you, cool. If it doesn't, you gave it a try. I thought I had a good time with this. But before we dive into the fish people in the lake... <laughs> we should go over media recommendations. And I have finished a book, which isn't my heart as a chainsaw. I went back to my heart as a chainsaw this morning. I was just like so stressed out. And I just needed a break from my heart as a chainsaw. So my break book was This Is How You Lose the Time War nice. by Max Gladstone. And I don't have the book on me because I let a friend borrow it yesterday. But I think it's Amal El Motar. Um, okay. <laughs> this book, listen, it's not horror. It is like sci-fi sapphic romance. But nice. This book is fucking incredible. Like, <laughs> I legit cried for like ten minutes after I finished this book. I, I was Wait, moved to is tears. this the one that blew up because somebody had talked about it? Yes, I was going to say, this is the one that blew up because Bigolus Dickolus, which was a Trigun fan Twitter account, tweeted <laughs> this book. <laughs> which is oh. funny that, like, a Trigun... I love Trigun, but, like, old old school anime. But um, 
a Trigun fan account on Twitter named Bigolus Dickolus, which is a fucking what is it? A Monty Python joke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> made this book go viral. <laughs> which, like, that's hilarious in its own right. But uh, the book deals with two women. One's named Red, the other's named Blue. And they're both agents. Um, I forget the name of their of their groups, but they both travel through time. And they're at war with each other. Red's group is kind of more like a militaristic sci-fi spy type military organization. Blue's group is from a world where humanity evolved um, combining with plants and created a hive mind. And the agency and this hive mind are at war with each other. And they're all traveling through time and kind of fucking up different parts of time and human history of different realities to fit their own agendas while they're fighting each other. And one battlefield at the end of it, Red looks down and finds a letter that's addressed to her. And it's by her, it's by her enemy named blue. And the book switches back and forth between red and blue's perspectives. And every chapter ends with the narrator for that, or the character for that chapter reading a letter that was left for them by the other character. That's cool. And it, and as the as the book continues, both of them begin to kind of fall in love with each other through these letters that they're leaving for each other, and it kind of makes you it it makes them question why are they fighting? Why are we doing this? What is the purpose of war? Uh, why are we fighting? We could just be in love with each other, stuff like that. I and like it. It sounds very sweet. Uh, it's it has some pretty heavy moments, but for the most part, it's pretty cozy until like the last 30 pages and then it just punches you in the face. Um, in, in a good way. I don't mean that in a bad way, but like it kind of pulls the rug out from under you and then it has a really impactful last 30 pages. And it was just a wonderful book. Like I can't really recommend it enough. Like I, even if you don't like romance, even if you don't like sci-fi, like give it a try. It is such a wonderful book and I'm happy I read it. Because I was feeling kind of burnt out, and just reading reading the story really made me feel invigorated with reading, and and that's why I was I'm going back to my heart as a chainsaw, just because I was kind of getting reading burnout, and reading yeah. a story like this really kind of reinvigorated me, so I can go back to like my heart as a chainsaw. I also started reading the Night Marchers and Other Strange Tales by Daniel Brom. Oh, cool! Which is his first short story collection. But Cemetery Dance has recently reprinted it with a new cover. And also, um, they have some new stories that weren't in the original printing. And if you like weird fiction, like surreal, eerie, strange fiction, I would I would say it's horror, but it's more kind of on the weird side. Like okay. Algernon Blackwood. Listening. Like I, I, I'd, I'd compare it to like Elgin on Blackwood or um, what's his face? Um, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I forget the other author. Um, but it's it's very much in the vein of like weirdness. Like the first okay. story in this collection is called Night of the uh, Music of the Spheres, and it follows these two these two guys who are trying to start a band, and they kind of suck. <laughs> and they stumble upon this pla- this place where everybody is in harmony. And they're all playing the song. And everyone's joining in and adding a new part to the song. That they're all playing together. And how it could possibly relate to creation, but also the destruction of everything. Oh. And then it just kind of cuts to like years later where both of our characters have separated and our narrator is still kind of traumatized from that night with the music. And like, not, he doesn't explain anything like nothing. Like it's, it's, it's complete weird fiction. Like nothing's explained. Yeah. Roll the punches. I'd compare to Kelly link a little bit as well. There's a Kelly link vibe with some of the stories too, but so far it's a wonderful collection. 
Yeah, this sounds amazing. So I'm enjoying that. I also. Oh, what the fuck was it? I I was uh, I saw the new Futurama episodes. I don't know if you guys have seen the new ones after the first. Yep. One. What's your <laughs> feeling about this new season? Nope. Yeah, it's disappointment. I feel like the 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 second episode. It like could have been. Felt... It could have been so much more. I mean, this was supposed to be an emotional fucking episode. Yeah, like, I felt I nothing. I, I thought I was gonna cry during it because Futurama has those yes. very heavy tearjerker episodes, and yes, this just failed in every way. Yes, like all the characterization felt wrong. The production value is so bad. And like, what's up with like? I, the show gives us a flashback to an older episode from when the show was good. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> yes, that's, because that's, that's like, like they're, like they're rubbing it in. Yeah, and then, but like, then it goes to now, and all our characters forget what happened 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and just, and also, what's the fucking deal with showing everyone's profile now? Yeah. It's like Leela is drawn in profile the entire fucking time. Well, that's weird. It's so fucking weird. And like, and even in that episode 20 years ago, we we knew back then that the children had Leela's DNA. Yeah. And then Leela forgets that they have her DNA and she's just like, oh, I was probably drunk. I'm drunk now. And I'm like, yes, that is not Leela's character. Exactly. That's what I said. I was like, that's not Leela. What the fuck? <laughs> Leela is the voice of reason. Leela is the, the, the responsible one. Yeah. Like, the, I haven't seen the third episode yet, but these first two episodes. Major I, disappointment. I'm <laughs> probably going to watch it because I love Futurama a lot. Me too, but I'm but probably just going to be fuming. <laughs> I've been super disappointed by these first two episodes. I know. This is, this is my fucking favorite. Like, one of my favorite series. This is my comfort shit. Like, Me if too. I if I feel bad or if I want to just watch something, I always put on Futurama. Me too. And now but... I'm like, and now I'm like, can't, can't, I can't help thinking like, wow, why are you shitting on my favorite show? Oh, man. Like, I remember when Futurama first came out on TV. I watched the first episode the night it came out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember that shit. Like, that was formative for me. Yeah. Like, and there's so many great episodes of Futurama, and the, the writing was always very smart. Yeah. And, like, it just but now, feels... but now it's just like, hey, let's just make fun of streamers, or let's just make fun of people who binge shit. And I'm like, oh, God. I mean, I, what the hell? I mean, it was a pandemic. What the hell could have it done? Yeah. And yeah. this is and this is people's comfort. Why are you making pe- fun of make people's comfort here? Yeah, like like, it, why, it like why are you demonizing it? Like what the fuck? <laughs> it, it doesn't feel like Futurama. No, it doesn't. And it just makes me sad because Futurama was such a good show. Yeah. And they could have done it with any other show, but they had to do it with Futurama. Mm-hmm. That's what I said. Stop milking the thing which is already dry. <laughs> <laughs> and like, and plus, Futurama had a fantastic finale. Twice. They had two fantastic yeah. finales. I know. Like, they brought it back and they gave it a second fantastic finale. Like, let it let it die. We we had a good show. Let it let yeah. it sleep. Yeah. It did its job. And I'm happy it did its job. Yeah. And now it's, it's time for Futurama ba- to sleep. It's basically getting the supernatural makeover. Yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, yeah, I'm not they, a fan of that. No, it's not. It's like Supernatural should have ended at episode no, at season five, because it was a fantastic season, and it yes. was a and it was a fantastic finale. I mean, it was a bittersweet thing because, of course, it's supposed to be a bittersweet thing. But no, the fandom wanted more, and I'm like, fuck you, fandom. Yeah, fuck <laughs> them. They can they can be so fucking toxic. Um, see, like executive, like people who are making this show, just listen to your gut. And if this, if yeah. you feel this should end, it should end. Yeah, like let, let, let sometimes just let things die. Yeah, and it's okay. Like we still have those memories. Exactly. 
But you know what, though? At least Enchanted is or Dischanted is good. Yes. Thank so, God for that. But 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 we know we we know why it's be good. It's because Matt, uh, like Matt is Matt Granning is working on it himself. Yeah. We know we <laughs> we should sure as sure hell <laughs> know that he's not working on this Futurama. I mean, yeah. he, honestly, he loved Futurama pretty early. Yeah. Like Futurama was mostly David X. Cohen, who I guess is still involved in the new season, but the writing staff is awful. Yeah. Um, but now Matt Groening, he's definitely more focused on Dischanted. I'm happy Matt Groening's still doing stuff. Because oh, yeah, like, yeah. he he has fuck you money. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, he does. Like the, the Simpsons have given him fuck you money. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm happy like he's still doing what he wants to do and following his passions. Because yeah. he's a very he's a very good animator and he's a very good illustrator. Yeah. And like I, I love his insights a lot too. Yeah, I agree. I just think, like, yeah, I don't know, like, where these writers are coming from. It's just not good. It's like, in the when they gave Futurama like a second chance, they they were they mentioned like they made fun of like, hey, this is a Comedy Central thing, and I'm like, oh, that's good because Comedy Central writers are pretty fucking good. So, I have yeah, high yeah. hopes. But no, I don't think they got Comedy Central writers now. But besides that, the only other thing really this week is. So I've been watching the anime Zom 100. I think I talked about it on, on here before. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what came out yesterday? Oh, buddy. The live-action Zom 100 movie. Oh, my God. Figures, Cause yeah. Because they're both based on the same manga. Which yeah. I found out is this by the same guy who did Alice on Borderlands. For real? Yeah. Oh, after, yeah, no, after no. He, now after I have to watch it. Yeah, after the mangaka who finished Alice in Borderlands, he started Zom 100. God damn it, I have to watch it now. Alice in Borderlands was so good. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, I'm only halfway done the live action movie. It's not as humorous as the manga is. The manga kind of leads into the comedy a lot. But um, so far, it's pretty faithful to the original story. Okay, cool. And like the acting's pretty solid. Like it's it's a decent it's a decent zombie movie so far. They still have the whole like he's happy, he no longer has to go to work because he was working for an exploitive company. And um he makes a bucket list of a hundred things he wants to accomplish before he becomes a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> and it just kind of follows him as he's accomplishing his bucket list of the people he meets along the way. Um, I'm about like an hour into the movie and it's, it's pretty good so far. The, the anime though, I will say this, the anime is fantastic. All right. It's easily the best anime this season. Um, and I recommend to anybody, even if you don't like anime, it's, it's worth, it's worth watching. It's not your typical anime kind of anime, but, um, it's still very much like he makes a bucket list of a hundred things he wants to accomplish before he becomes a zombie. But what's cool about the anime is, like, in the first episode, it's all the first half of it is in dull colors. It's all very muted. It's all very dull. And it's meant to look like our main character is kind of like a zombie, but it kind of fits this, like, dull, exploitive work thing. And then when the zombie apocalypse happens, the anime bursts into color. <laughs> because he's finally alive now. And what's cool about the anime is instead of all like the blood, the blood's all rainbow colors. Oh, that's awesome. So like all the blood and like insides and stuff, it's all colored with different like yellow, pink, purple, red. It's all different rainbow colors and stuff to kind of illustrate everything. Um, and it's the anime is really, really good. If you have Netflix, no, I'm not sure if it's on Netflix. It's on Hulu and it's on Crunchyroll. It's on Netflix. It's on Netflix. On Netflix has it, both the anime and the live action. Uh well, yeah, I think so. At least I, 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 I saw the anime only on Netflix, like I think a couple of days ago. So maybe the live action might arrive now. I don't know. Yeah, I mean the live action is on that on that Netflix now because I know it's on Crunchyroll. I know it's on Hulu, so it mm. might be on Netflix too. Yeah, but um, I would I would recommend either. They're but they're both really good options, and they're not your kind of typical zombie story. Like they do have your kind of typical zombie story elements. I think my favorite is in the first episode of the anime. And this is in the movie as well. They do a bit different in the movie. His boss. So he has a crush on the secretary in his office. 
but she's having sex with his boss because, you know, it's the Japanese boss who's exploiting all his employees because he has all the power. So, like, he's pretty much leveraging her to have sex with her. And um, the first thing our protagonist does when the zombie apocalypse happens is go to her apartment to save her because he has a crush on her. And he gets there, and she's a zombie, and his boss is also a zombie. And he gives his boss a quitting speech about leaving his job <laughs> when his boss is a zombie. That's amazing. It's it's There's a good playful sense of humor about it, but it does also take things seriously. There's one part where there's a couple, this is in both the anime and the movie, there's a married couple who's like watching everything in horror, and then our character comes climbing down the fucking pipe on the side of their apartment, and he's like, I'm going to the convenience store. Do you guys want anything? And they're just like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and then he goes to the convenience store and he gets them what they want, but when he gets back to their apartment, they're both dead. <laughs> oh, okay. But he's like, but the whole, the whole idea is like, he's taking things not as serious as like, you kind of should in the zombie apocalypse. But to him, his life has just been so dull that he's finally able to live his full life. And plus, if you know anything about Japan, you know how much they're, how awful their work culture is. But uh, Matt, what about you? Yes. Well, all right. Uh, this week, I read and finished uh, the newest issue of Vastarian. So, volume oh, six. Yes. It's so good. I think this... Don't officially quote me on this. I would have to look back. But I think this is the first issue where they have Paula D. Ash also as one of the co-editors. So that's super cool. Uh, um, but Ash is so fucking. Yeah. So it, 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 anyway, I've, st I talk about this every time it comes out. I just love it. There's so many good stories in here. And this one doesn't have as many uh, nonfiction or as many poems as some of the other ones. Past issues have, which, you know, you can give or take. I always like reading some of the poems and uh, the nonfiction stuff is always great that I, I always appreciate what people. I love, um, I love the nonfiction stuff in Vastarian. The poetry is also always very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's just cool. Like, especially when you're like digging into some of the nonfiction, it's just imagining all the work they put into it is just amazing. So it's, it, that one's really, so anyway, not as much in this one, but I'm not complaining. It's still a very great issue. Uh, just a couple of the stories that, really stuck out first of all brian evanson has a new story in here and it's called tilbury i might be pronouncing it wrong tilbury or something like that and it's basically just about uh people being born from bones and collecting the wine from church to feed to your bone and then eventually this bone wants to feed on you to grow into a uh, human and so it's just this I mean, it's it's Brian Evanson. You can't go wrong with that. And I think it's a it's a new one. So that's even cooler. So if you're looking for a new Brian Evanson, look in there. Uh, some of the other ones in here is this um, one called The Elephant in the Room by Patrick Hurley, in which at first you have no idea what's going on. It's just like this weird experiment where your people have to guess like a color of something or what they're touching. And then like if they get it wrong, they disappear and then eventually somebody gets it right and then more people show up and it's like this whole like thing where it's just tons and tons of people in this blank room and they're all having to guess what a certain item is and then you it it jumps to somebody in an office talking about how their new computer and basically their new AI can uh figure out anything and and you <laughs> and it's just this fascinating idea of like is it really AI or is it just a bunch of people disappearing in some void uh, um so i really like that one and then there's two other ones that just really stuck out. So there's a Dr. Raymond Thoss, which if you're a big Ligotti person, you know that last name of Thoss and the idea of Dr. Thoss. And so this story is one, actually, I think we should cover at some point. It's a take on Lovecraft's, um, was it the witch, is it witch in the dream house? Or I think that's what it's called. I even witch think in the dream did, house. Yeah. So it's a take on that, and it is basically this idea of this new doctor coming in saying the character from Witch in the Dream House was wrong and didn't understand what this witch and what this house 
is. And so uh, basically was wrong in thinking like you need to think more philosophically and less mathematical on what this ghost is and what this witch is and goes through. And at first you're like reading it and it sort of reads a little like nonfiction because it's really detailed in like sources and all this stuff. And you're like, wait, what's going on? And then eventually it gets to the point where you're like, oh, wait, no, this is a fiction story. This character is like going to this house and this character's had like horrible trauma the whole life. And you um, just realize like what their plan is to get to this witch. And the ending is just like perfect. And it's funny because I have this like random theory. Dr. Raymond Thoss is a pseudonym. We don't know who it's for. And when you read this, you can kind of get some theories on, uh, at least in my head, and partly because I was tired, but I was like, I wonder if this is somebody we all know and we just hasn't come out yet. I did a lot of Google research. There is no, um, they've only been really appearing in Vastarian issues and there is no real name behind it. So it it's a secret mystery that John Padgett and all of them are holding uh, tight but I'm just wondering who it could be. And then there, the final is an essay about uh, pessimism between H.P. Lovecraft and Thomas Ligotti. And that one's really fascinating. It's even like what I think is interesting too with this nonfiction piece and with some of the other ones in these issues is the like take on actually writing like a horror story and how to tur like, either one, how to make it better, or like what is happening in a horror story when you're writing it. And this one just really looks at the fact that like Lovecraft never really went far enough with his pessimism and how he really stuck with like more of a traditional kind of storytelling, even when it stuff is weird happening in there. It's still kind of this straight line and where this essay was pointing at Ligotti is much more circular and much more dreamlike in his descriptions of stuff. And it was just um, stuff like we, uh, like if you've read a lot of his work, you kind of know, but to like read a nonfiction piece about it and really compare it, compare, uh, I think they did Sect of the Idiot and then they did, I'm trying to think about Lovecraft story, um, something where they have to go into a town. Anyway, <laughs> it's just, it was, it was cool so to see. every the, Lovecraft story. Right, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> It was just a fascinating comparison of the two and just looking at weird fiction and pessimism and hiding pessimism in your story and how you can kind of like take that and put it out a little bit more. So anyway, great issue, Vastarian. I highly recommend it. I always do and I always will. If you can get a subscription, either print or digital, you should do it. A lot of great work it's in here. A, it's, it's an amazing literary journal. It is. Yeah. I, I love Vastarian. It's just, They're one of my it's white just, whales. I really want to get published in them one day. That would be really cool. Yeah, it's it's awesome. Also, like it's sort of tangentially, there's a, a a Krista Carmen story in which we had her on a couple weeks ago talking about their <laughs> uh, their anthology and reading this story. It, you can kind of see she is also doing a house that you can't leave from, and what the haunting is in there is a little bit more. And I was it it was just really funny to read it after talking to them and talking to her. <laughs> So anyway, I read that. And the other thing is I saw the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem movie. How was it? Yeah. It is so good. Uh, Oh, thank God. Yeah. I need to see it so bad. It's uh, there's so much I can say. Uh, Let's see. First is uh, the animation style like is just amazing somebody i saw earlier describe it is it almost looks like claymation um just the way they styled all the characters but isn't it isn't it more like you know into the spider wars yes which that's where i was going with is like i like personally i almost think this is just a little bit better than that just because of this Partly because it's all dark i really liked all this like the dark grittiness of it all and Mm. just they added a lot of a lot of fun flourishes to everything and just the animation is great and like i read something yesterday where they the animators were thinking of like what teens how teens would draw and 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 all this stuff so they kind of did that style but then whenever there's actually like fighting action it's all really smooth that just makes it look good and shows how fast they are 
Um, so for th- anyway, I, I will say for the anime nerds, the actor who voiced Donatello is a big JoJo's Bizarre Adventure fan, so he's wearing Aww. a JoJo's Bizarre Adventure hoodie in the uh, in the movie. Aww. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, so animation top notch, absolutely amazing. I. It, I, it's definitely on level with into or across the Spider Verse or into the Spider Verse. Personally, just across I like it. Across Spider Verse was amazing. Yeah, like, I, I, think it, mm-hmm. I love that yeah. movie. Yeah, it. it I, I love that movie too. Uh, <laughs> so let's see that uh, Turtles. Uh, what they they focus more on and, and like is not a complaint is, but just to, for people to know is they definitely focus more on the teenage aspect of them. Hence why it's all teenagers doing the voices. And... Yeah, I feel, I feel like that makes sense. Yeah. No, I, it, I, I expected that, honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it, and I, I liked it. I mean, it's a different, like, it's a different take on the turtles, which I, I mean, I love all the different variations of them. Personally, my yeah. favorite is, of course, the original from 1987 because I grew up with it. <laughs> but but I still love all the different kinds of variations that we've had with them. I just I love it. Yeah. Have you ever yeah. read the original comic of it, Lemay? I, I have. Yes. They're I so fucking the bleak. It's yeah. so dark, and they turned into like the happiest, like funnest cartoon. Yeah. I know. I I mean, it's it's the it's the same with the mask. The mask comic is fucking oh, dark. Yeah. Oh, the mask is fucking brutal. That's like a horror comic. It is. Like, yeah. he's like a fucking serial so killer. Jim Carrey slapstick comedy movie. I know. Yeah. So I, I I appreciate the changes they made for that. Because, <laughs> I I mean, I think kids nowadays, they are ready to read the original comics now. But at that time, yeah. probably not. Yeah. <laughs> I will say, I think The Last Ronin is one of the best Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics ever made. Oh yeah, no, they're doing. Really they're doing. They're doing another one. Yeah, they are. It's gonna be. It's gonna be the new turtles. Yes, and I'm so excited. I'm, I'm so excited to see how these new turtles turn out. Ah, I yeah. love it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm always I, gonna be a turtles fan. So yeah. Yeah. It. Yeah. So it. It's. They do amazing job. They. It, they do great in there. There's a lot of uh, homages to earlier st- turtle stuff, and even like just different styles there's like a there's a a side i don't know i call it like a side scrolling scene that's like almost not quite but straight out of old boy uh <laughs> so that was really <laughs> yes. cool to see uh it's just it's it's great and they set it up because i know they're doing a show and they're going to do another movie so it's all setting up for that um you know it's a tight movie it's like an hour and 39 minutes and you're oh, you don't yeah. Yeah, so it's it's just it's a blast. I absolutely loved it. Um, the music is great. I mean, it's Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. You can't really complain about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, highly highly recommend going to see it. Everyone, you'll love it. It's super good. Um, and yeah, that that's it for me this week. Vitlame, what about you? I mean, this week has been hectic, and I haven't really had that much. Like the only time that I've been like dealing from like as a me time for me is just going to the gym and that's basically like one or two hours but yes. i honestly i've been going i'm doing lots of hikes for me time and hiking has been so wonderful right it's like it, it does wonders for your mental health man it really does i love just being out there and uh yeah but anyway <laughs> yeah so uh, my husband and i we just we've been watching uh star trek strange new world it's well, so good I know we're almost finished with the season one, and I'm just like, I love this. This is so much fun. It reminds me of like classic Star Trek. Yeah, it does, and I am in love with the guy who plays Spock. He plays it amazing. So good. I love. I love New Worlds. It is. It is so good. It's really good, and it's and it's. I find it also so funny that the actor, like who plays um, Pike, he. I mean, for anyone who didn't know who, like, how um, William Shatner looked like when he pl- was playing Kirk, they look exactly the same almost. Yeah, yeah, they do. It's it's um like it's uncanny how similar they look. It's Actually, almost that, it's almost that William Shatner and Timothy Oliphant had a baby, and Pike is the love child. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, we're we're gonna we're, we're aiming to finish that season, and we're. 
like getting season two as well. Yeah. And season uh, two has a musical episode. <laughs> okay, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, I did finish also, um, Boys in the Valley by Philip Fragasi. I haven't started that one yet. How, how was it? I know you were disappointed that it was like, I'm st- demon I mean, possession. it was I a mean, vampire, I, it was vampire no. or demon possession. No, well, the thing is, I was like, so sidetracked by that. Like I, for some reason thought that it, that it was <clears throat> about, like some kind of vampirism because uh, how yeah. it was described in the blurb it said like the sickness the sickness starts to spread within the orphanage and i'm like okay sounds like it's strange or something mm, interesting so i was like hyped about that but then i should have gone a little bit like up and up on the blurb when they doing the the comp titles and they said like Lord of the Flies meets the Exorcist. Exorcist, and I'm like, <laughs> ah, that's not vampires at all. But, and, but, but how as did I you like it, despite your miss, you expected one thing, you got a different thing. The thing is, as I like, when I discovered that, that it, like with these kind of comp titles, I was still dis- disappointed because these comp titles did not match <laughs> at all. It's like they like using Lord of the Flies because Lord of the Flies is one of my favorite stories. I love it's that story. It's a bit. It is yeah. a great book. So good. But wh- why would you use that title and like bas- the, the basic theme of the story when there are adults in the story as well? Yeah. That doesn't I make mean, sense because in the in Lord of, in the Lord of the Flies, they are kids that are fending for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. But in this story, they're not. There are priests and adults that are helping them. Yeah, okay, I see what you mean. Right? And also, The Exorcist, not also a great describer. (laughs) Like, yes, it has, like, a demon possession story, but nothing like The The Exorcist. At all. It's like, we like you like I said, you can also you can almost just look at it from the from the point of view that is maybe that it might not be a demon possession story because like as one of the characters said, like they're just kids who look like who are angry with what like with how they are treated and they're just getting revenge. And I'm like, yeah, I mean that could happen. Why didn't you just yeah. make it about that? Why did you yeah. have to roll fucking demons into this that don't that don't do anything? I like so demons. I, I like demons too, but like they hey, demons, I'm your boy. They, they didn't do as much. Like I, I don't know. Maybe I had too high expectations for it. Well, I mean, that being said, like fucking Stephen King had this big blurb for it about how much he loved it, and like the book had so much hype that like yeah. expectations for this book are already pretty high. And I don't mean this in a bad way so i feel really bad saying this and if you think it's too mean matt you can edit all this out in post um <laughs> but i tried reading a boy alone with strangers that big novel that philip Fracassi put out mm-hmm. and there's a description in the first paragraph that made me stop reading oh no because it's like this character is tied to a chair and he's been punched in the face and his teeth are knocked out, but it's like his teeth were like splayed down his T-shirt. And I'm just like, if he's sitting in a chair bound with his teeth knocked out, his teeth would either be fucking in his throat or they'd be on the ground. They wouldn't be all over his shirt. And I just stopped reading. <laughs> yeah, there was there was a scene in the book that... Uh, like for me felt like a plot hole that needed to be fixed it's like when they like and this might be a little bit spoiler but i'm not i'm not gonna say who when the team like the possessed kids kill one of the child the one of the children they do it in a shed outside of the orphanage and there's snow and then and they had just recently snowed and then when the others discover the body. It's suddenly in the chapel inside the orphanage, yep. hung up, like as like like the kid had hung himself, 
on the huh. cross. Huh. And like it's a visceral, it's a visceral description, and then there's and then there's a, like a shocking thing, and I'm like, yeah, but then I kept thinking, wouldn't there be evidence of them dragging the fucking corpse in outside? Yeah. Yeah. And they, and like and they went there, like the other characters went to the shed, and I'm like, look at the fucking ground. And nothing was addressed to that. I'm like, mm, I would have said something. <laughs> I would have said something too. So yeah, like I mean, Fergus's this writing is good, but I yeah, I think the hype was a little bit too much, and yeah, like I got sidetracked. Like, and, and that's completely on me. I'm not I'm not yeah. saying that's because like it's the book's fault or anything like that. It's just completely on me. But I expected a lot more. And I, I get didn't that. get it. Uh, and it's just like, oh, okay. I mean, because if you're, uh, for me, I don't know, if for me, if you're going with, like, a demon possession story, you need to hide, like, you need to turn up the volume. Like, you need to crank it up. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and in, like if you're in, to... both, in, in both ridiculousness and just how gory or just far out biblical sense it's going to be. Yeah. And plus, if you're going to compare something to Lord of the Flies... Like, I can think of two books that I compare to Lord of the Flies. Lost of the Skies, people. Yeah. Yeah, this is Lost of the Skies and the Troop. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the Troop has adults in it, but the Troop is also more the kids fending for themselves. Laws of the Skies are kids fending for themselves. Mm -hmm. That's what that book is about. Yeah. It's <laughs> stuck alone, trying to fend for themselves, and this idea about what civilization does to us. And what happens to us if we leave civilization for too long? Yes. I love Lord of the Flies. I know. I used to teach that book a lot. <laughs> it's just, this is like my favorite book. It's like, it left such a big impact on me. Yeah, no, I totally get that. But should we um, hop over to the uh, swamps of New Jersey? <laughs> yeah. So I'm good. I'm not familiar with like the layout of New Jersey, but is it really that swampy? Parts of it are. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. New Jersey, <laughs> Matt, so like, Matt is like, oh, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I dated someone who lived in New Jersey. So was, I, she, I, was she a swamp thing? No. Uh, I mean, honestly, she cheated on me with, with a drug dealer and relapsed on drugs. So, yeah, she was a swamp thing, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there yeah. you go. There you there go. You go. <laughs> <laughs> she lived on the nice part of Jersey because her parents owned – a very successful Chinese restaurant right near the financial district in New York. So, oh, all right. All right. Her Is that Yonkers, maybe? Uh, well, she lived, oh, she nice. lived in um, Bergen County. Where oh, okay, okay. America, Bergen County is where, like, Puff Daddy lives. <laughs> Bergen <laughs> okay. County is where Chris Rock has a house. Okay, okay. Well, <laughs> Bergen, Bergen County is fucking rich. Um, <laughs> one of the... A, a mafia person lived in my girlfriend's neighborhood, and every Valentine's Day, he'd go to everyone's house and bring roses to them. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> that's so Italian. Yeah. <laughs> it's also telling he was in the mob, too, but... Yep. <laughs> <besides that. laughs> um, Northern Jersey has lots of wealth in it. Yeah. And Southern Jersey's were kind of... It's very swampy. Is that so, where Jersey Shore is? Is what where? Is that where it's, like the show Jersey Shore is being taken? Uh, Jersey Shore is kind of like near Atlantic Beach. So that's like South Jersey, bordering uh, another state. Oh, okay. Uh, it's but, it's I'm I'm just trying to get like the mental picture where I can like visualize where this is all is. <laughs> so yeah, New Jersey's a state where like there's not lots of hills, but there's also marshes and swamplands. And is that is board. that why it's called the Green State? Yes. And New Jersey, uh, like J Jersey, is the Garden State. The oh, garden the garden, yeah, the, the Garden yeah. State. Jersey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jersey has wonderful landscapes. The highway, I forget the name of it. Is it the Jersey Turnpike? No, it's not the Jersey Turnpike. The highway that goes through New Jersey has some beautiful scenery when you drive down it, hmm. like gorgeous scenery. But yeah, like I've been to New Jersey a few times, so I was pretty well familiar with. With some of this stuff. New Jersey yeah, also has the second biggest shopping mall in America. Oh, it's there. 
Oh no, Mall of America is the biggest one. That's more in the Midwest, but New Jersey has All the right. second biggest. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> the Mall of America is so big, there's a roller coaster inside it. Yeah, but it's a cheat. Um, let me tell you, I've been to the Mall of America. They repeat stores. Oh, I bet they, they re- do. It's- they repeat stores. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you you think you're going to this giant mall to like be just amazed by everything but unless i was like in some weird time like loop or i was in some maze and i was passing the same thing but it's like you just realized you finally walked in a circle (laughs) 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 oh my god you might be right i might have walked in a big circle (laughs) all these stores are the same i just saw them I thought the military is good at teaching directions, Matt. <laughs> yeah, but a mall, a mall has its own directions. Like, <laughs> it just, once you get into one of those giant buildings, like the compass just spins in a circle. <laughs> once you go in, you never come out. <laughs> yes. Oh my god. But let's get back to some swampiness here. Um, yes. Man, you know what's funny? So before we like get into it, and this what I'm gonna compare it to is a loose comparison is it reminded me a bit of the night we went to the horror show. By Joe Dude, Hanson. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> okay, good. It, 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 it had the night they missed the horror show vibes. Yes, it, 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 it follows that, and we'll explain that in a second. But just like as I was going, I mean, and again, it's like a loose comparison, but I was just like, oh, this feels just yeah. like this kind of idea. Um, but. Yeah, it's 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 not very similar, but it has the vibes of the yes. night they missed the horror show, which, if you haven't read it, is a wonderful short story. Yes. Okay, I need to check it out. Uh, and by wonderful, I mean absolutely traumatic and fucking terrible. But <laughs> it is a really great short story. Written really well, and it it's just that like so. Anyway, like uh, we'll, let's we'll get to there. Let's get to this thing. So yeah, we have what two people. They're sitting in front of a house, or like in their backyard, and they're talking. And it's um, F- Phil is the neighbor, and our main car- or our narrator for part of this is just like, "Hey, have you ever?" He's a writer. He's looking for an ideas, and he's asking about a haunting. And Phil then goes into this crazy story that happened to him and his buddy or his cousin Donnie. Uh, um, yeah, and it it's so it just like it's. And again, we'll get to that writing part because I have some thoughts. And Vitlame, you were you kind of touched on it when we first started talking. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, Donnie and Phil, not the greatest of people. They do drugs and kind of they scumbags, decide. I guess you could say. Yeah, total scumbags. <laughs> and they, they decide to. They need money to get a fix, so they're like, "Ah, oh, we're gonna go bust this old lady." And distract her and go steal a bunch of stuff from her house. And then we can sell it and make drugs. Well, Donnie's crazy. This is the cousin of Phil. And as soon as they open the door, he socks them, socks the old lady. And they go in, they steal stuff. They run across this guy. And the guy's like, what's going on? And he's described as a tub of goo. (laughs) So not exactly the best uh, description (laughs) for this guy. And then just, uh, what, it was like a week later, they get picked up um, by this tub of goo guy. And you realize that the old lady they hit was the mother of, like, a local mob boss. Yep. And they're going to get shot and taken to the swamp. But then it quickly turns into, hey, we see these really cool lizard monsters that we call, what, slumps or slinks? Um, It was like slumps, I think. Yeah. I mean, yeah verify we have the name for this slacks and it just goes off the rails from there it just (laughs) and those those creatures are very hungry yeah (laughs) and they're kind of zombies a little bit too like yeah i think the people they bit transformed into them or like something yeah there's not something about like the dna mixing with them and then like the offspring carry the similarities yeah, of the person I think they like, ate. Was, there was like some description, like they had the voice or like a tattoo or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, they like. I was gonna ask about this, 
because first, like the description, or, or even before that, they're talking about they're taking the Hackensack River, and they're like, "Oh man, all the chemical waste dumped into this river is like mutating things here, and these lizards and frog things started mutating into bigger, bigger things, and then they started like eating the dead bodies." And I, I do love this idea of like the these slacks like were basically trained to hear gunshots at this point. <laughs> and so they would just come out and whatever person was shot, they would just eat up. And like, we, we get this idea of like, Oh, they eat through the bone and they just, they, they, <laughs> they love. They, you, they basically leave nothing behind. Yes. They love uh, human flesh. Uh, it just, eat, well, in specific, they love eating. I think it was throats and assholes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and they like, eat everything. Like, they leave nothing behind. Oh, my God. And so these two mob guys are like, we have a theory that they'll eat live per people. So we're going to... We're, we're going to test it out. They're going to test it out tonight. <laughs> um, but, and, and then, of course, it goes horribly wrong and and things happen. But, yeah, that, like, DNA thing that you bring up is interesting because at first they're like... Oh, that one guy, that one slack looks like a dude we offed last week. And then they, like, because I was trying to figure it out, too, if it was like they pass the DNA or the slack that bites the person becomes the person. I mean, yeah, I was if, if they're going... Sure. If they're going with, like they said, like they leave nothing behind, I'm going with the theory that whatever DNA is left kind of just mutates into what is living in this swamps. I can see that. Yeah, it's disappointing that it's really explained. So you just kind of got to try to make it make I mean, sense. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, I think it also just comes with the fact that these are guys who have no idea what the fuck is in, in there. So they just are That's coming true. up with their own ass, like their own weird ass theories. So I think with everything that is happening in this story, it's just, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point because obviously because these because these are just stories that the, these mobs are telling them maybe just to you know scare off the guys they're about to kill, but then we don't see these evidence these this kind of evidence ourselves. Yeah, because because yeah. this is a sto- because this is a story within a story. So we as readers, we're not giving we're not being giving the the whole thing. You know, we're just giving bits and pieces. And, uh, and the story I, the stories told from narrators we can't fully trust as well. Exactly. Is that why it ends the way it sort of ends? Is that re- like sort of reveal of him not being very good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense then. Okay. That's yeah. why. That's why. Like at the beginning of the story, that he, the the main guy, the narrator, the the first narrator that is. Is just asking for a spooky story, and he got he got what he wanted. But then he had he had a little bit of an aftermath that he needed to add. Like, oh yeah, by the way, this guy was a fucking scumbag. So, yeah. <laughs> at least at least I got what I got. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that makes so because I was thinking about that. Like, did we need the top and the end of this story like could it have just been that lizard idea or whatever this is um i feel the that top makes and the, the yeah the top of the end they kind of frame everything yeah mm-hmm. um i i think it would work without it but i think having that framing device makes things make a little bit more sense slash makes you question like is he is it was he accurate about these slacks? Like, are yeah, they- or, or or just or just was he just you know pulling my leg? Yeah, because because he because I asked the story like, hey, you know of a spooky story, and he's like, ha, do I have one for you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because we don't get like the evidence of the main narrator actually going to the swamp and check for himself, you know? Right, that's yeah. true. I also love the artwork that's on tour.com for like the cover of the short story. Oh yeah, it's really yeah, good. It's really good. That's uh, what that's what drew me to this one to pick it. I'm like, oh, I love this artwork. Let's read this story. <laughs> I 
mean, people say don't judge, judge a book by its cover, but we totally do. So yeah. But I also honestly. liked how um they, there's a little Flannery O'Connor reference in the story as well. Is there? Yeah, he said if only there was someone to shoot him every day of his life or shoot her every oh. day of her life, which is from a good thing is hard that. to find by Flannery O'Connor. Okay. Yes. All right. That makes sense. Because like at, when I first read it, I was like. I know this line, but it re- reads weird here. Okay, that makes sense. That's interesting. They yeah, it was a, there. It is like, and I think that kind of ties into like the theme of that story a little bit too, because the whole idea of a good man is hard to find is like, Flannery O'Connor is just saying people can't change their nature in that story. That's one of the main themes is just like, um, a, what makes person a, a good person also comes up in this as well a little bit but yeah. like also the idea of changing one's nature those are two main themes of a good man is hard to find so the fact that like this references that kind of shows that jeffrey ford had that in mind as he was writing this story mm. that makes complete sense yeah and that Which also it, kept... that, it drives the home it drives home the ending definitely yeah yeah which if you haven't read a good man is hard to find that lemay i'd recommend it i think you'd like it a lot Okay. Um, it's about this family who is going on a vacation, and at the beginning, the grandmother's reading a newspaper about this man called the Misfit, who has escaped from jail and he's murdered people. And the grandma's a bitch. She's she's an awful person, mm. and she makes the family's life a living hell. She demands a drive to this old plantation that she used to vacation at when she was little. And <laughs> it's okay. the South, baby. It's the South. It was written in the fifties or sixties too. Wait. And the grandmother's also very racist in this story too. No That's shit. <laughs> and her her whole thing is a good man is some a good person is someone who looks like a good person. They have the fair skin. They have the educated upbringing. That's how the grandmother sees things. The, 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 the story is painting her in a very bad light. Flannery O'Connor had her issues too, but the grandmother's not supposed to be a sympathetic character. Um, Does she um, have her comeuppance? Uh, the misfit kills everybody at the end of the story. All right, then. <laughs> but like um, the misfit says after he kills her, he'd be like, if only there was someone to shoot her every day of her life. Mm, yeah. Um, but yeah, the whole, the whole idea is just like the idea of changing one's nature what makes a good person? And now that I'm thinking about that, I'm like, oh, this fits into the themes of a little bit of what's happening in this story, too. Yeah. Yeah. It really does, like, yeah. Just kept making it seem like, or at least Phil, as he's telling his story of this, like, you know, oh, I don't want to be like Donnie. I'm really trying my best to, like, be yeah. better. And yeah, all of yeah, these yeah. Things. But um, then, But then in the end, you're like, no, 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 he still has to come back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I, I think that I think having that connection makes this a little bit more interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One thing I, I one thing I liked about the story is I think Jeffrey Ford has a really strong voice. Yes. Like I think his voice and his writing is very very strong. Yes. Um, well, and the way he captures voice, all yes. these characters have this particular type of voice, and it just like just the way they speak and what they're saying and how they're doing stuff, everything in it, like you. You you buy it all because you're like, okay, I can see this. I've heard people like this. It's mm-hmm. yes. I think the my only nitpick is and, and that's probably just because I am not that used to like a story within a story, is I sometimes was it, it felt a little bit of hard for me to keep up like who was being who when the like when the narrator said I said. Yeah. Yeah. Because because if the narrator like if the story had begun with just a third person point of view, starting and saying like, "Hey, when Mike and Phil Phil were doing this," I would have not been able to be like, "Oh wait, is Phil saying this now? Like within the story, or is it the narrator?" Yeah. So I could I could give you a a, a good tip for reading stories within the story. <laughs> yeah. If the par- if the paragraph begins with a quotation mark, it's the narrator of the story telling the story from the story. 
if the paragraph ends in a quotation mark and there's a quote in the next line, that is our either first person narrator interjecting or saying something. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, that's the best because I've read I read this fantasy book, Empire of the Vampire, which is this like 800 page fantasy horror novel. That's a like giant story within the story. <laughs> I like the rhyme. And like of the so, title. Uh, part of it's it's a great title. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the whole the whole book is our main character is telling his story to the chronicler. So you have scenes where like the narrator and the chronicler are kind of talking to each other, but then most of the book is just there's a quotation at the start of the paragraph, and everything is what our main character is saying that's being written down as a story from the story. And it'll be interjections here and there, but overall it's just what the story is. Okay. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's a small little thing, but I think once you notice it, it makes it easier to follow. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I will say if it's your first time reading one of these, it's yeah. very, it, it feels a bit clunky and it feels a bit strange. Yeah. And it's so. tricky with like a shorter story because you can't, you know, like with the longer ones, you can kind of add in nice section breaks and chapter breaks to kind of really help bring you in. So like that, like the fisherman, it, he, it, it's not so, I don't, like, I don't want to say seamless, but it, it, there, there's a stop there's where you're like, okay, breaks. yeah, so like you, now you, I'm you know in this story. To, you know when you get to this chapter, it's the story within the story. When you get to the next chapter, the story within the story is over. Yeah, so that helps. Um, this one, it's yes. a little. It, I can like it. I can get where you're like, okay, well, wait, where did it end? Where am I at? And all that stuff. Um, yeah, so that makes total sense. Um, maybe anyway, like so to go back way back to Lansdale. Uh, um, I, I think the reason I kind of thought this, and maybe you did too, Rich, was just this idea of like these two guys and just the way it escalates, especially because they're getting picked up by yeah some people by the mobsters <laughs> yeah and, and like and in both of the, both of the stories our characters don't understand why this is happening yeah <laughs> until like it gets to the point and they're like oh okay but yeah. like because like in um yeah what, what is it in the night they dismissed the horror show was it because they were the, the kids were like dragging the dog with their car yeah, it was that. That's why the mafia guys were just like, "The fuck you guys doing?" And and yeah. Oh, they had the black kid with them too. They had the black kid with him. Yeah, and that made the just, mafia guys angry too. Yeah, yeah, it was like all around bad, and then it just yeah. like escalates to a point where you're not, ex, you know, you're not expecting it, and that's the same here where you're like, okay, these two mob guys got them. They're gonna get shot or. You know, and you like, you know, it's a haunting story, but you're like thinking, well, something it's going to be something else. You're not expecting lizard mutants. <laughs> <laughs> I, and then you're just like, what the heck? Every time I, this is this is a, this is a this is a horrible side tangent. But every time I'm reading a horror story and there's like Italian mafia guys, I always think of the mob guys from the pig. <laughs> every fucking time. <laughs> Well, that's where I was gonna go because I, I actually I kind of <laughs> thought that too. It's so funny because they all like in these stories, these three that we're talking about right now. It's like they're not the way the writers make these mobsters. They're not just that kind of straightforward Goodfellas kind of mobster. Like but they're very goofy, funny. like yeah, like they're funny, goofy, goofy. Like they're kind of funny. <laughs> and they always have some crazy plan. <laughs> it's like and like. It's, it always just goes to the far left fields. Yeah. <laughs> and like, yeah, it's like every, every time I just think of like the guys from the pig every time. <laughs> uh, oh my God. That's hilarious. I'm glad I'm, glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> like, no, uh, like as soon as it started going weird, I was just like, okay, this is like, Night at the Horror Show, or Night I Miss the Horror Show, and then, yeah, then the pig uh, kind of comes in there, too, because it's always two. It's always, like, two mobsters. It's, it's, it's always two. It's always two. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and they they always are goofy, and their plans are always not what you're expecting. <laughs> yes. 
And like, I kind of love that. I love that trope. Like, I, I think it's a really great trope that isn't used enough. No, oh, I think it, it it's great. It's it's a nice surprise when you get it. You're like, all right, cool. You know, like they're not just uh, straightforward. They they they're doing something a little different. Yeah, and like I don't know. I feel like it. I don't want to say breath of fresh air because I've definitely noticed that this is a trope. But we're so used to the straightforward, mean Goodfellas type mobsters. Yeah. Or like the Tony Sopranos, where like yeah. they'll flip on a switch. But to like have the goofy, silly mobster guys that still have the sinister edge to them, I think is yeah. a really nice touch. Yeah, I mean, like their plan is to kill these two, and their plan yeah. was to feed them to lizards. But it's the lizard part that you're like, wait, what? <laughs> exactly. Or it's like the, the night they missed the horror show. It's like, yeah, they put them, lock up the kids in the trunk, and throw in the car into the river. Yeah. But like. But first, they you know, take them to funny. that weird place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a weird uh snuff film thing. And you're like, wait, what's happening? Yeah. Oh man, I love that story. That is that is one of my favorite Lansdale short stories. Yeah. That's also an old one too. We did that ep- we did that story a long fucking time ago. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this was a blast. This is a fun one. I think people should hunt should read it. Like we said, it's on tour.com. I'll put this. Yeah. I'll put a link in the show notes so you can uh, take a take yeah, a read. It's, it's, take free a to, it's free to read on tour.com. You can buy if you want it for your Kindle. You can pay a dollar on Amazon and get it on your Kindle. Although personally, I'd wait because every year Tor releases a giant Kindle collection. That's yeah. all the tour.com short stories they publish that year. Oh, that's nice. Every and they they sell it for like a dollar or two dollars, and it's all the tour.com stories. That's awesome. So, like, I'd, I'd recommend waiting to like they release that if you want to just dive into the tour.com stuff. They at tour.com, they do if you only care about horror, they have the horror short stories here and there. They they play around in genres, but you do get a decent amount of horror when it comes to their short stories. Yeah. Um, I, I'm I feel like oh, this is something different for us a little bit. I want to give Nightmare Magazine or The Dark a little bit of a break because we use them a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but not to disrespect them because those are great publications. So you should check them out too. Yeah. Um, I feel like we need to spread the love around. Yes. But I'm glad both of you enjoyed the story. Maybe you enjoy it a bit more now after this conversation than you did on your first read. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's one thing I like about doing this show is... um. When we sometimes we read a story and it doesn't click with us right away. But if we think about the story, we discuss the story, things kind of begin to fall into place. Yeah. And I think it can build a better appreciation for that story. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, this is tour.com. It's a great short story. Um, I'm, I'll find another one for us next week. I'll get a nice spoopy one. Get the spoops going. There you but, go. um, Matt, where can Lucas get in touch with you? Yeah, so I am still on Twitter at Brandenburg DM. I'm, I'm sorry, Twitter. we don't dead name on this podcast, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, X. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on that thing. Uh, I'm also on Blue Sky, but honestly, I think it's just my name, Matt Brandenburg. I don't know how you would look me up otherwise. So, but I'm on there yeah. too. A uh, bit, Lemay, you're still on your social media hiatus. I am. <clears throat> I am. Yeah, but I'm like slowly, like posting stuff on Blue Sky as well. I'm on Blue Sky as Little Man Mist. Uh, I and yeah, and I'm also I'm also on the dead name <laughs> at, uh, at Little Man S. So like I said, if people want to get in touch, they can just DM me, and I'm quick to quick to answer. But still on social media breaks, still finding my mojo. So yeah. So I am on a Twitter, oh X. I'm sorry, break where I have deleted my account, which I feel is doing me a disservice as a writer because it's really good for networking and it's really good for promotion. Yeah. But I just couldn't put myself through the harassment that that site kind of yeah caters to towards uh, marginalized groups of people. Is the yeah. best way to put it. Mm-hmm. Well, I've seen a lot of people on Blue Sky, so. I'm on Blue Sky. You can follow me on Blue Sky at uh, my name, Rich Rich Gerlach. Yeah, so uh, I think you'll fi- you'll find the community there. Yeah, 
And you can also follow Abyss with add into staring. I'll still post from the Abyss account. Um, I won't I won't stop that because that because the main reason why I deleted my Twitter is I was so ingrained with horror Twitter, ska Twitter, a um punk rock Twitter, and Jewish Twitter. And since Musk took over, Jewish Twitter, the algorithm has conflated Judaism and anti-Semitism. So a lot of Jewish Twitter users are getting lots of anti-Semitic stuff in their feed because the algorithm is conflating the two together. And I just couldn't take it anymore. It was just becoming too much for, for me. So that's why I'm no longer on, on, on the dead name. But the, if I use, I use the Abyss account, that's just in the horror genre and the weird fiction genre. So I won't get any of the other bullshit. So I'll still post from Add Into Staring. You can follow me on Blue Sky with uh, just my name, Rich, Rich Gerlach. And this is Richard Gerlach saying, keep staring. Keep staring.